Hi, I'd like to talk now about Kohlberg's theory of moral growth and development. Uh, as you know, there are six stages to moral development in Kohlberg's theory. Three major levels and six stages. The first level is what he calls pre-conventional. This is a very immature stage or level of, of moral development. The first stage is punishment and obedience. This is what we see with small children who have not learned to speak clearly yet or who don't understand commands, or even some who have learned you know, to speak but still do not understand the concept of right and wrong. In that case, it's very difficult to reason with small children. You have to impose some kind of punishment to get them to behave, whatever that punishment may be. It doesn't have to necessarily be harsh, but it has to be enough to get them to not do something which is detrimental to their own well-being or to the well-being of people around them. So um, just saying it to a small child, you know, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't run out in the road, that's, that's not nice, that's not a good parent. A good parent has to be much more forceful than that to protect your child's life. So some people get stuck in this pre-conventional stage and throughout the rest of their lives will only behave when there's a threat of punishment, when there's someone around who can see them and cause trouble for them if they misbehave. Now the second stage, if the first stage is punishment, or, or let's say the stick, the second stage is the carrot. It's the stage of reward. He calls it instrumental and relative, or instrum, in other versions of the book he says instrument and relativity, whatever. What he's talking about is bribery, in a sense, that you can children realize that if they do certain things people will be good to them so in a sense children learn to sort of bribe other people and are in turn open to being bribed to do good things so parents offer their children uh, treats or special you know going to the movies candy ice cream whatever things with the child which the child likes to get them to do what is the right thing to do and in the same way children will kind of like suck up to their parents curry favor with their parents by doing certain things in order to get mommy and daddy you know to buy you a new fire truck or whatever it is so this kind of view of, of moral uh, of morality is based upon the idea of you know you will only do what's right if there's something in it for you. And there are many adults who still remain in that stage of what's in it for me? Why should I do this thing? You know, what do I get out of it? You know, and, and so instead of doing things because it's the right thing to do, people do the right thing perhaps simply because they're going to get some kind of reward for it. Now the, the second level or the conventional level has two stages. The first, in, the first one is what he calls the uh, interpersonal concordance orientation what I refer to as peer pressure and the peer pressure stage is where people are concerned not so much about instant gratification or getting a, a specific reward reward but about being accepted by their social group they want to be acknowledged to be a good son or daughter a good brother or sister a good member of uh, a social group you know uh, the in crowd, the, the 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 jock crowd, the whatever crowd you're in, the gang. So people do what the gang determines to be, you know, uh, expected behavior. So their definition of right and wrong is simply whatever the group decides is right and wrong. Um, that's why when we look at the question that I posed a few weeks back about the manager who was willing to skip steps in product testing Jim in my opinion was in stage 3 peer pressure because he knew what was doing what he was doing was wrong he knew it was against company policy he knew perhaps it was against the law even but he was willing to do it because his immediate group the other managers the other guys around him at work considered it to be okay to do that so Jim's sort of compass of determining right and wrong was determined entirely by his immediate surrounding group of people who 
you know, he worked with, whom he worked with. Now, some of you said that Jim was at stage four, which is the law and order, the, the view of the wider society. Uh, I think not. I think that what Kohlberg means by this, uh, the law and order orientation is an orientation where you, your decisions about good and bad, right and wrong, are determined simply by the legal structure of the of the wider society, of the United States. In other words, if you behave in accordance with the law, you're a good person. If you behave in ways which are contrary to law, you're a bad person. So when we're thinking about moral issues, uh, whether it's you know in business ethics or whatever, a person in level f in stage four would say, "Well, I didn't break any laws. If I didn't break the law, then I'm okay." So this way of thinking is very much oriented toward letting the society at large, the the the, the the broader American society or whatever society you belong to, French, British, German, you know, anything, whatever, Nigerian, your society determines what's legal and illegal, and that becomes your definition of good and bad. Uh, the final level of, of moral growth is what he calls the post-conventional stage, and Kohlberg says that state post-conventional level, stage five in this in this level is the social contract orientation. And this is a is a stage in which people have their own moral principles to some degree, but they're not completely certain about them and they admit that other people may also have competing moral principles. And so they are willing to sit down like congressmen and negotiate to compromise their principles in order to resolve any discrepancies or differences with other people. So the idea here is that people are not committed to a specific set of principles but are committed to the idea of talking reasonably with other people to try and find something that everyone can agree on. The final stage of moral development Kohlberg calls the universal ethical principles stage uh, this refers to someone like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., someone who committed his life to ending segregation because he felt that there was a higher law than the law of the land. So he's transcending or attempting to transcend American law and say, well, you know, I believe that there is a higher law and that we need to adhere to that higher law. And even if I go to jail, the thing that made Dr. King so special was the fact that he wasn't opposed to going to jail. If people wanted to imprison him for his beliefs, that was fine. He was he was okay with that because um, he felt, okay, as an American citizen, I have to obey the law or accept the consequences. But he knew that by being imprisoned in a way which he felt was totally unjust and unrighteous, this would only help his cause. So he was not um, a sort of destructive but he was very militant in his views of opposing segregation but it was a, a non-violent militancy and he really put his life on the line for what he believed and eventually was killed and he knew he would probably be killed but he didn't he didn't really care about that he 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 felt that what he was doing transcended his, his own life and this is an example of someone who's committed to you know uh, an ultimate sort of moral principle and this represents Kohlberg's I think sixth stage sixth stage of moral development so that's about it for Kohlberg and for our manager Jim who was in my opinion in stage three um, but as long as you gave your reasons for why you thought he was in stage four I will accept it because uh, you could interpret it that, that way although uh, I still think it was stage three all right. Uh, next time I'll see you. I'll talk about Jill. All right. Bye-bye.